Okay, everyone, we are now recording this session. Um, so it uh, may or may not be uh, re rebroadcast in the future, but uh, we wanted to at least welcome everyone today to our second of our three part uh, series on venture capital. We are going to be talking today with uh, a couple of gentlemen uh, about venture capital and how mentorship works in that regard. If you'll recall, mm -hmm. our first session was about uh, was talking with companies who had looked for capital, utilized venture capital, and the uh, the benefits and and perhaps some of the maybe the not challenges isn't the word, but uh, some of the things that come along with venture capital, and um, and the intent of this series is to really work on and help our board uh, develop a better understanding of venture capital, how it plays a part within um, the, the state, as well as educate the public and other entrepreneurs on how it works so that we can uh, make better decisions and really more than anything, help our entrepreneurial um, ecosystem, if you will, grow in Wyoming. And, and so to that end, I, we're, we're talking today about mentorship, and I'll introduce our, our guests here in a moment, but um, I wanted to kind of just remind everybody why we were here and what we were, we were uh, really kind of focused on. And, and over the next few months, we're going to continue to work on our application and hopefully be funded for the State Small Business Credit Initiative, which is um, a, some money that is available to states to utilize, and in our case, we're going to utilize that for venture capital funding of individual businesses, as well as funding funds for venture capital. And um, we've got a, a plan and we've submitted that, and now we're waiting on directory, or excuse me, direction from the treasury on how we can, how we can fund that, when that money will be here, and how we can start. So those are federal dollars. And what's pretty interesting about that is those federal dollars, we can invest those directly with, uh, with a company. Whereas in, in the case of our BRC funds, for example, we are not allowed to invest those directly without that adequate consideration. And so we're really excited about how we can utilize this for venture capital because we know that the, the venture capital portion of Wyoming, it's not so much that it doesn't exist because it does, but we, are, we see it as a way to really aid that venture capital, get more deals going and, and provide more funding and allow the state to benefit from that. And so the, the great thing about this uh, exercise is that we'll get to um, understand the entrepreneurial ecosystem even more in, in Wyoming, understand how the funding can make a difference in Wyoming, as well as see what the other areas that might need some help. And we, we like to think about things like funding, obviously, but we also, think about, we also think about policy and how policy can make a difference for entrepreneurs in Wyoming. So we're, going, we're really excited about this, this angle that we're able to take now with uh, what's called SSBCI. Um, one of the longer acronyms we'll, we'll uh, throw around, and, um, and what it's going to mean for not just the state, but also for the entrepreneurs in the state and recruiting to the state, as well as um, expanding the businesses in the state, giving them perhaps maybe a little bit longer runway. Um, and, and with that, um, this, is, this conversation was really spurred on by our co-chair, Aaron Moore, who, who thought, you know, we've, we've got some big topics that we're going to cover this year and big topics that we're going to be part of. And venture capital is one of them that we want to make sure that the public as well as our board has an ample opportunity to discuss what's happening. And so we're going to, uh, to take today's conversation in, in a couple different ways. The first portion of our conversation, we'll be talking with our guests about um, about how they've mentored the situations they've been in and they've seen for entrepreneurs in Wyoming as well as, and then we'll open it back up to the board for discussion there. We will take uh, questions from the audience and attendees, if you can chat those in using the, the uh, I believe it's called the question and answer portion. If you would, would uh, write your questions in there, we will be able to scan those and then ask them of um, our guests or the board. Um, with that, uh, Ms. Moore, anything you'd like to add before I introduce our guests? No, I just like to thank both um, Matt and Alex for joining us. And you know, this is just a great opportunity for us to dig a little bit deeper into some very complex topics so we can make sure that as we set up this program, we're on a good path, so cool. 
Well said. Well, with that, I will introduce Alex Moromsev and Matt Kaufman. So Alex Moromsev is on the board of directors of Silicon Kular. And really, Silicon Kular is one of those uh, entities in the state that helps entrepreneurs, not just with funding, but also mentorship. We've got a number of programs. I'll let Alex talk more about those in a moment. Um, but he's been a, a, a great um, asset to the state of Wyoming and to um, businesses throughout the state. And uh, we really look forward to hearing from him. Um, he was one of the first people I met um, when I took on this job. And, uh, and he's been uh, very willing to help as well as uh, provide, you know, kind of a pathway for how we should be doing things in the state. So we really appreciate his, his uh, involvement here. We also have Matt Kaufman, who is a partner at Hathaway and Coons. In, he's based in Cheyenne. I don't know if you can save venture capital in Wyoming without thinking about Matt Kaufman. He has been uh, a, an instrumental part in a number of funds as well as with entrepreneurs and he's an entrepreneur himself. And so we're really excited to have both of these gentlemen here to answer questions and to talk a little bit about how they fit in and uh, share their expertise with the state. So Matt and Alex, thank you very much for, for joining today. Um, with that, I, I think what I'll do, if, if it's all right with you, Matt, is I'm going to turn it over to you and have you just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your history with, with mentorship and, and your expertise in venture capital, and, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Alex. Sounds great. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't want to spend too much time you know, going over my background, but maybe I think what might be helpful just to frame up for those of you that I don't know, uh, kind of how I set down this path. And, and I think it's appropriate for the conversation because it's a path I think a lot of people in Wyoming have been down. Um, you know, when I first started practicing law, I was fortunate to, to fall into uh, working with and advising uh, a family office here in Wyoming that did a lot of merger and acquisitions of, of small businesses, of tech businesses, oil and gas businesses, and so I spent the first, I don't know, three, four, five years of, of private practice just doing deals um, a lot with, with that family office. And what I, what I quickly recognized in Wyoming was for those small and emerging and growing businesses, there was no one to help them. And when I say no one, I mean no one to help them. And it just was kind of alarming to me. Um, and, and I wasn't the person helping them. I was the person usually acquiring them or negotiating with them. Um, and that, that sort of transitioned for me into a phase where I decided actually to go back to school and get a graduate law degree uh, at the University of Colorado in entrepreneurial law uh, because I, I just had such a passion for this area and, and helping uh, sort of companies. What I, what I, what I grew to understand very quickly uh, and in some ways I'm envious, but also in some ways I'm not. What I quickly understood was I, I sort of became part of the, of the greater Boulder, Colorado, University of Colorado startup ecosystem. And for those of you that are familiar with that system down there, there's a couple of venture capital firms that have a really high profile and high presence. There's a couple of law firms, there's a couple of accounting firms, there's engineering firms, there's software firms that have a real high presence. And all these people come together with the university with state resources, and it makes this incredibly robust, you know, confluence of, of factors where startups and entrepreneurs have loads of resources available to them and people that know, if they don't know how to help them, people that know them how to get, you know, to where they need to be. And what was frustrating to me immediately was in Wyoming, we have these pockets of resources, but, you know, 15 years ago, 16, 17 years ago, as I looked at the Wyoming landscape, I saw huge holes, you know, for how, how people could navigate that. And of course, one of those holes being uh, in the venture capital funding space. And maybe I'm, I'm sure everybody on this call has a different definition of venture capital. That's at least been my experience is everyone hears and, and describes that term differently. But for me, venture capital is not, I mean, it's early stage capital, but it's not seed stage. It's not, not hyper early stage. This is high growth, usually high pressure capital with an intention, right? With a purpose, uh, you're deploying that capital to accelerate growth. Venture capitalists are looking to uh, mentor to help companies grow, right? They're looking to arbitrage their, their pockets of knowledge and the industries that they know well to help those companies accelerate growth. And that, again, not, not speaking ill of the state of Wyoming, but that's just been a huge gap for us, right? And I, I think for me, part of the frustration was the recognition that 
um, you know, I was spending a lot of time in, in Boulder and kind of as part of that, that startup ecosystem, uh, I got to, to mentor and work with a lot of companies who went through a program called Techstars, which is a large accelerator down there. I got to work with the Techstars board mentoring dozens and dozens of companies going through that, that process. And what I became, again, quickly jealous of was everybody down there had this immediate grasp and sort of baseline knowledge of, all right, here's seed stage capital, right? We're going to go talk to friends and family and maybe some angel investors, right? Then there's, you know, later stage early capital. And then there's venture capital and private equity is not even in the picture for most startup companies, right? That's something different and bigger and later. And what, what really frustrated me was one, in Wyoming, we didn't have a level set on those definitions. And so a lot of people weren't even talking about the same thing. Um, I think that looks and reflects really poorly on Wyoming and on Wyoming entrepreneurs when they go to talk to those professional sources of capital. So that, that was a frustration for me. But then also... I think as a venture capitalist looks at, at the state of Wyoming, they're looking for synergies, right? They're looking for opportunities to throw gas on the flame, right? For these companies to thrive and grow and for their money to, uh, to help accelerate those companies' growth. And we have a, tremendous examples of that, not tons and tons of examples of that, but more, more, more difficult for Wyoming to describe is we've, we've got geographic dispersion of some pockets of activity We've also got, you know, tiny little towns like Dubois, Wyoming. I'll give a shout out to, to Mr. Kinsler over there that that there's startup activity happening in little bitty towns like that that nobody knows about. But that's a real challenge for a lot of a lot of outsiders from Wyoming to get their minds around. Right. That this isn't all happening in one college town or this isn't all happening in one uh, metropolitan area. So anyways, as, as that, that's at least how I kind of came into this problem and, and became really passionate about helping companies was it's 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 almost. I don't know, it's almost a, a threefold problem in my mind. One, there's the educational piece of getting everybody on the same page of what type of capital is appropriate, what type of capital do you need, and then finding that capital, right, if it exists in Wyoming. And in a lot of those cases, maybe the, the right kind of capital doesn't exist in Wyoming. The second, the second piece of that education for me is then deal terms, right? Again, I've attended, I've literally attended workshops um, in, in places uh, like, uh, Boulder, Colorado and Silicon Valley, where VCs and entrepreneurs and locals get together just to talk about deal terms. What's everybody doing, right? What are they doing on their liquidation preference? What are they doing on series A and series B, right? What are valuation ranges? I mean, all these things, and it starts to create, I don't want to call it homogeneity, but it starts to call sort of cultivate standardization of, of deal terms. And so both the investor and the entrepreneur kind of have an idea of, of where the market is at and how deals are going. But what I, what I think a lot of people don't appreciate is for the entrepreneur raising money and for the VC looking for deals, that tremendously shortens the gap, right? That they're trying to overcome to make those deals happen. And uh, again, that, that's just not a language that I've observed that we have a lot of. We have it in Wyoming, but, but not enough of it. And then, and then the thir third sort of the bigger piece is then, okay, you, you overcome those two, those two initial hurdles um, just just the, the lack of, from a VC's perspective, lack of deal flow in Wyoming, and from the entrepreneur's perspective, the lack of deal availability, you know, and funding sources. And obviously, that's something that we've, you all have, have talked tremendously about. And, you know, I, I come back from a policy perspective, come back to the, the days of endow and what, what we sort of coined the term of churn, you know, we just, we have to, we need more churn in Wyoming, we need to keep more companies going through that pipeline and evolution so that there's more attractiveness to later stage funding opportunities for, for the deal searchers and for the venture capitalists. Uh, but also we just, we just need that activity to spur more of those, those first two criteria that I talked about, right? Creating some uh, predictability for both uh, what kinds of deals are out there, what kind of capital is out there, and then also what, what, kind, what kinds of terms are out there. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm super agnostic when it comes to the industry sector. Obviously, these days I spend a lot of time working in crypto and in and around uh, the crypto space. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about the growth. I think um, it, it's more about finding the right kind of capital with the right kind of, of entrepreneur and right kind of startup. And where I, where I see huge opportunities is, again, like create, creating more optionality at both ends of that spectrum. So I'll stop there and we can... <laughs> come back if we want to. No, that's great, Matt. And, and I think that that gives everybody kind of that, that level set and, and uh, helps people understand some of the, some of the bigger challenges that we'll probably dive into a little bit more in, in depth today. 
um, just as it relates to that mentorship and, and as it relates to getting set up and, and how to take best advantage of the of the fragile or, or maybe not quite existent ecosystem in Wyoming and how do we develop that. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over to Alex and, uh, and Alex, uh, if you could do the same, provide a little bit of background, a little bit of understanding and, and provide um, just a, a little bit of view of, of Wyoming as it relates to venture capital and the, and the companies and the, and the sources that you see. Absolutely, honored to, to be here. So, so my background is I was an institutional investor most recently uh, for a big financial services firm called TIAA. They may manage some of the folks in this audience's money. I was a managing director there and uh, oversaw $2 billion in, in global equities. I moved to Wyoming to Jackson in 2010 and became involved with an organization that had just started called Silicon Coolwater. And the origin of Silicon Coolar is it came out of an economic conference uh, put on by John Schechter called 22 and 21, meaning county number 22. And what was the vision in the 21st century for what we were going to be, become? And this was still in the throes of the uh, great financial crisis. And it was worth trying to think, you know, what's the economic base of Teton County going to be going forward because it had been so heavily dependent on tourism and, and real estate and construction. So one of the takeaways from that conference was there are entrepreneurs in Teton Valley and each entrepreneur thinks that he or she is the only one. <laughs> they were lonely, they were isolated. And we thought, okay, how do we create an ecosystem, a support group and help people find you know, intellectual property attorneys and you know, software developers and, and all, the, all the services that, that startups need and just provide a community because it can be very lonely. And so Silicon Kuwar created a, a chance meetings, you know, a monthly, monthly networking function, an angel group, a pitch day, uh, a educational uh, system that's now called Startup Success. And we realized that one thing that was missing was <clears throat> a mentorship program. And basically, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, getting money is great. But even if you have all the money in the world, you can still fail or blow up spectacularly. And it's not just startups. You can look at Wall Street or some of these very high profile venture capital companies that have done that recently. Um, you need, you need some advice and even some handholding. So we tried to create a mentorship program and we realized it just wasn't a success. And then what we did is we teamed up with uh, MIT's Venture Mentor Service and they have developed this mentorship program and then um, turned it into that a program and they effectively license it to other organizations. So we sent four people to Cambridge Mass for three days of training and we have this thick playbook on, on how you do it. And it's a really good structure and that, that took off. So that's one of our um, iconic programs. Now we have over 30 companies participating. The other key to the success of our mentorship program is Teton County is blessed with an incredible brain trust of you know, successful and often wealthy people who have moved here. They're either working remotely, they're semi-retired or they're fully retired, but clearly they, they wanna stay engaged and it's also a really fun peer group for them. And I would define mentorship as being you know, for early stage startups because at some point you'll have a more formal advisory board. And then when you start taking you know, institutional capital from venture capital firms, you will have a formal board. And hopefully they're providing a lot of the same services as a mentor. But the mentor, you know, they can provide some industry expertise. Very often they are simply someone you can talk to because being an entrepreneur is really lonely. And as somebody you can share your successes with, but when things are going bad, 
you know, your partner or your beer buddies, they may not have that much patience or understanding for what you're going through. And a good mentor can help with, you know, business development contacts or introducing you to people for fundraising. There are a lot of different services. And so in talking to you, I'm wearing both my Silicon Coolwater hat, but I'm also very active as an angel investor and mentor and an advisor to a few companies in Wyoming and, and help with some fundraising. So the, the goal, the ultimate goal of Silicon Coolwater is to you know, create this ecosystem to promote entrepreneurship. And I say some of the challenges that we see is whether it's Teton County or, or Wyoming overall, it's a small market and it's also a limited talent pool. You know, sometimes it's hard to recruit your team or recruit staff. It's a little bit easier now with, with remote work, um, but that can be a challenge. Another challenge is so far, we don't have the critical mass of any particular industry. So for example, if I wanted to start some type of food or beverage business, I'd go to Boulder because there's so many successful startups there in that space and so many people who know the industry that it's, it's probably the best place to be for all the connections and resources. Uh, for software, I, I might go to Bozeman because of Montana State University and there've been uh, a lot of software startups there and a couple of spectacular exits. And for FinTech, I'd probably go to Boise. Where there's a lot going on there. Uh, another point I'll make that Matt also referenced is one event that is critical to really jumpstart a local or regional or statewide entrepreneurial ecosystem is to have that big exit. And I forget the name of the company in, in Bozeman, but there was a software startup there that had couple hundred employees and Oracle bought them in 2010 for I think 1.8 billion dollars. And the beauty of that is this created a lot of millionaires, some of whom went on to become entrepreneurs and start new firms and others went off to become you know angel investors or high net worth investors and again to foster all this growth and entrepreneurship. And we're, we're not quite there yet in in Wyoming, but I think we're close with, with a couple of firms. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. So, well, and thanks, Alex, and, and thanks, Matt and Alex, for, for joining. This is, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because I think you guys have seen a lot. And, and we're going to, obviously, one of the big reasons that we're doing this series is to, to think about how do we craft a program with this funding and how do we influence policy to make it work? And so thinking in those terms is, is great, but I do want to take a quick dive into, into just some, maybe some more stories a little bit uh, from the from the entrepreneur's perspective, because I do want to make sure that we're thinking about them as an audience and, and entrepreneurs who are out there, um, you know, utilizing this and saying, you know, here are some really good resources for me. And so I'm going to start with the, with, with you guys sharing a couple more stories, maybe. Um, Either one of you can can take this one, and and whoever takes it first, if you've got something to add afterwards, great. Um, but here's here's the question: what what are some of the things that entrepreneurs worry about when it comes to funding that maybe they shouldn't? And and you guys see that a lot. Matt, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a whole bunch of things. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that they don't worry about that they should. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the next question. So don't okay. be jumping ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the most common things that, that I've seen is, and I, I, I don't even know how to quickly and succinctly describe this without getting too far into the weeds, but th there is, a, again, bear in mind, I come at this from the corporate legal you know, background. So one of the first things that I usually spend time doing with companies is talking through sort of the corporate and capital structure, right? What, what do you want this to look like? What does it need to look like to accommodate growth? 
and, and I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs get really paralyzed in fear with respect to making those decisions. And they hear a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And again, part of that comes from different types of education. If you take the out of the box Silicon Valley tech company, right? It's gonna be two classes of stock. It's gonna be preferred and common and right. There's gonna be five board members and like, there's this whole stack of things that is just what people expect and what they do. That is not the case here. And so sometimes I feel with, with some entrepreneurs that trying to trying to make and fit and retroactively sort of shape the company corporately to fit everybody else's model isn't necessarily the right call. Maybe it is the right call, right? And so I think a lot of that depends not so much. So, so to, to, I'm getting to answering your question. I think what, what people maybe shouldn't think as much about is everybody seems to be focused on who are my investors, right? And, and of course, valuation and, and what type of capital is going to be convertible debt or, or equity or whatever is usually the first thing they're thinking about. And oftentimes, one of the first questions I'm asking them is what types of capital are you looking at, right? What's your, what's your ultimate goal with this thing? Are you wanting to run this as a lifestyle company for the next 20 years? Because if you are, that's a completely different conversation, right? Then we're, we're building this thing to exit in six years or whatever the case may be. So I, I sometimes feel like people get caught into that. I, it has to look this way and it has to be shaped this way. Uh, not everybody's trying to achieve the same thing, right? Not everybody's trying to, to accomplish that same structure. And so I feel like, and, and the, uh, the metaphor I give entrepreneurs all the time is the legal corporate structure from my perspective is just like building a house, right? We can always change it, but it's gonna be way more expensive and way more time intensive to fix it later than to do it, do it right the first time. And so just take a little bit of time to think through the trajectory and ultimately what you want. And of course, there's going to be pivots. Of course, there's going to be changes. That's just part of being an entrepreneur. But I think for me, a lot of it has to do with what types of capital and what type of trajectory they see for themselves, as opposed to just, I know this person, I need to get a hundred dollars dollar check from them, you know? Um, so that's, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, that's, that, that is very helpful. And I, I like, I like your concept of, of that foundation and, um, and thinking about, you know, it, you could, you could always change later, but it becomes expensive. And I'm going to come back to that here in a second. Um, not when we think about corporate structure and capitalization, but maybe when we think about product market fits. So um, stay tuned on that one a little bit. And, and Alex, do you have anything to add to that one? Oh, yeah. So from an investor point of view or a mentor point of view, it is really good to, to suss out, you know, is this company going to be a lifestyle company? Mm -hmm. um, because if there's no exit, you know, your capital could be tied up for a long time and there, and there are ways to get your capital out or extract it. But, you know, it's, it's not going to be, you're not going to make 10 times your money on a lifestyle brand. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's, you know, a certain business model. Um, secondly is there are a lot of businesses that are worth investing in, but they may not be suitable for traditional venture capital money. Because again, they tend to look for very high growth and multiples of return. And usually, you know, not to generalize too much, that can be software, that can be biotech or, you know, life sciences. Um, but a lot of businesses, they just won't grow that way. So there are other ways to finance them or different groups of investors to go to. And then, you know, once you have that initial capital, you, you may be able to bootstrap it. I don't know if I would ever say to an investor, I mean, a, a, an entrepreneur, oh, you shouldn't be worrying about, about money. <laughs> you know, because you have your payables, your receivables, and you're trying to finance everything. One of the big challenges I see is companies, they can go out and they can raise that initial initial 250,000, 500,000 friends and family round. And that's enough to get them started. Maybe they wanted to employees, they're generating revenues. And then all of a sudden they need working capital. You know, how do I pay for all my inventory and my work in progress before it's actually a finished product that I can sell? And then maybe I'm selling it to a store and they're paying me in 30 or 45 or 60 days. So I have a big financing gap. And ideally, you wouldn't want to finance that with equity, 
because you're diluting your ownership. But then when you tr try to go to banks, it's really tough. The banks just are not structured to finance startups. And usually, you know, they're too young. They don't have a long enough credit history. Um, very often the startups are very much their, you know, B to C internet based or their intellectual capital. So, so there are no assets that you could borrow against. And that's, that's really frustrating for me as an advisor and for these entrepreneurs. And, you know, I can think of one company here that's in the clothing business and they've been generating around a million dollars in revenue. They'd been in business for five years and their bank gave them a $10,000 line of credit. And after six months, I think they increased it to $20,000. And that's, I mean, it's almost not worth the bother. So that, that's a real challenge. So let's, let's take that, maybe let's take that a little bit further in, in a, in, for the next few minutes and, and think about how, how would you suggest, or let's say you had kind of a magic, a little bit of a magic wand. So the state's getting, you know, maybe some money to be able to invest in companies and invest in funds to fund companies that are Wyoming based. What would you, what would you require or what should, should those companies have to have to get that money so that they can be focused on their product market fit and making sure that works and not necessarily worried about the pressure of that money. Is there something, is there some sort of magic that can happen? Is there an advisor? Is there like what you're doing with mentorship? Is there some sort of program? Is this a like an accounting firm type of thing? I don't wanna deal with accounting, so I, so I farm it out. Is there something like that or should there be something like that that the companies in the state could take advantage of? Wow. Um, All right, that's a lot. I, I apologize. I'll, you could punt it over to Matt. He looks like he's ready for it. Okay, I'll, I'll punt it to Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that is a lot. Uh, I'm going to say a whole bunch of things that are probably somewhat hmm. unrelated, but I, I believe in all of them. I mean, I mean for one, I, I really think, and I genuinely, I, I believe this to my core, that Wyoming, we all know this to be true. Wyoming is such a tight knit place, right? Wyoming really does root for Wyoming companies. And that's one of my favorite things about helping, you know, and, and working with startup companies from around the state is uh, e even though it doesn't look like raising money in, you know, Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas, people in Wyoming will get behind good Wyoming ideas and Wyoming companies. Uh, organizations like Silicon Kular and a lot of the pitch competitions we've got going on are doing a great job. I mean, that is something that has been so needed for such a long time. But I really think we've got to find ways in a cohesive manner to, to elevate that, right? And to continue to raise the profile of those companies looking to raise money. So that's one thing I would fix with, with a magic wand is just that visibility and networking piece of, again, the, the funding sources that are out there, which in a lot of cases, just, you know, individual and uh, angels here in Wyoming with the companies that are looking and the same, the same is true for, for the, for the mentorship. And I, I think, I, I, again, I, 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 I'm hesitant to kind of go down this path too far, but I think it's necessary to some extent. I think we've got to double and triple down on those areas where we're winning, right. And where we've got an advantage. And that's a really unpopular thing to say in state government uh, from a policy perspective. We used to call it the peanut butter approach, right? We kind of want to just give everybody a little bit and spread money around so everybody feels fairly treated. That's fine. I get that from a policy perspective. But in, in industries like this, I again, I, I, I say this too often, but we got to throw gas on the flames that are burning. And there's some pockets of activity where we really have either legal or regulatory advantages. We have geographic advantages. We have you know human resource advantages here in Wyoming. There's, there's not a gajillion of those different niches, but we need to we need to really accelerate those. And I think in some of those instances, we have great mentors available. We have great sources of capital available. We have great companies. Um, I, I'm just I'm really, really big on the sort of connectivity piece of all of that because I just time and time and time and time again, see companies come here and get frustrated and then go places where it's just more visible. It's easier to plug in. And uh, so I, it, it, it helps with recruiting, it helps with talent retention, it helps with capital raising with you, you know, service professionals, everything down the line. 
that visibility and that networking piece. So to, to me, that would be one of the things. So to answer your question more directly, Josh, I think <laughs> state program funding that addresses any of those things, right, Go, goes a long way. Um, I don't mean this to sound like a self-serving comment because I'm a startup lawyer, but we need more people like me. There, there aren't very oh, yeah. many. Right. There, there just aren't very many. I don't, uh, I, I, it's, it's terrible. We hardly have any IP attorneys in the state. I mean, we hardly have any. Um, so, so for same with accounting, I mean, I, I, all the time hear from companies, I need a really good startup accountant that, that understands this. And there's just not very many. So service professionals is a really, really big one. Um, ta- I mean, talent retention and recruiting, I think is a big one. Um, yeah, I could, I could talk about this all day long. I'll stop there. Well, well, Matt, I, I do want to, I do want to, uh, talk a little bit about what you said, cause here, here's, uh, a couple of things that have come out in the, in this conversation already. And I think it's important for all of us to think about is that, you know, one of the things that, and I'll, I'll say that we're a quasi state agency. So luckily <laughs> we only have to spread a little bit of peanut butter, a little, little places, but uh, we, we get to be selective on where the bread is uh, or where the peanut butter is on the bread, I guess. Um, but, but I'll say it like this. Um, we, we, what I heard was we've got to focus We've got to make sure that we focus and we've got to make sure that we, and I've heard clusters and focus a few times in this and big wins. And so I think it's, it's not, um, it's okay for us to, to solve the problem with the right answer. Right. If you're, and, and it's okay for us to say, we have to pick the areas that we have strengths in and that we can grow in so that we can maybe spread a little bit more peanut butter later, but right now we have to be selective in order for this to work. And I, I know that, that our board has, has been making those kinds of decisions where they're making hard decisions. And, you know, frankly, that comes in the way of saying no sometimes to things that are, they're good projects, but they're not ones for us. And so I'm glad that you're saying that because as somebody with the expertise to know that you can't just spread it around and think it's going to work. Um, And that we do have to focus in on certain industries, certain areas, certain advantages that we already have. Um, That's really, it's really, really helpful to hear that Um, because it's a hypothesis that I think we've had, we've all had. And sometimes it just takes the confidence to say it and to, to move forward with that. Well, and just to to put a fine point on that and not to, not to double down on this metaphor, but as I was thinking about what to say today, I mean, it, it's kind of funny that the topic today was venture capital because, right? I mean, look at the venture capital model, right? Venture capitalists typically have an industry segment of particular expertise, right? They pick a handful of bets, right? And they focus on those. And the ones that start winning, they double and triple down on, right? I mean, so at the end of the day, the venture capital model becomes a very narrow funnel. That's a very proven and very successful model, right? We don't do that in policy. We don't do that in in government. This is not meant, I'm not blaming anyone here. You guys are great, but I mean, just the the larger we, that's just not how we approach state programs, but where where we are in the unique position in Wyoming, I don't know if anybody has a more updated statistic than me, but four or five years ago, we were the last in the country, even behind Puerto Rico in venture capital deals. And so being near the bottom of the barrel in terms of venture capital, I don't know how we're ever going to move that needle if we don't focus, right? If we don't focus in some of those areas where we can win. Yeah. Yeah. Good. No, thank you for that. And um, yeah, that's, that's good. Aaron, um, I'm, I'm totally cool with you jumping in and (laughs) and actually in terms of timing, it might be a good, might be a good time. We could, we could turn it back over to Alex uh, for a minute, but then we could turn it back over to the board um, also. So happy to do that. Yeah, so so Matt and Alex both, so when we talk about that, like where, let's talk about a little bit more specifics around where we think, um, you know, some of those um, assets are from a, a Wyoming perspective, you know, your thoughts around that I think are important. You mean industries to focus on or? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe yeah, well- where we, yeah, where do we, where should we be? discussing about our focus and and drawing in there and you could even take it i mean matt kind of laid out the model right you you focus in on an area and then you you double and triple down on the winners of that area so where are you winning and where are you seeing wins that we could build on is that aaron does that kind of Mm -hmm. match up with what you're asking yeah yeah i mean building on matt's point 
it would be great to, you know, beef, beef up some of the resources for entrepreneurs such as, you know, legal and accounting. I'm, I'm not sure how we do that. Um, yeah, perhaps there's some type of tax credit. That's, that's the one disadvantage of being in a, a state with no state income tax is you, you can't throw around tax credits uh, to the same uh, effectiveness that other states do it. Um, we actually, I'm, I'm always very impressed and, and proud of the diversity of startup industries that we have here in Jackson. Um, but probably the largest sector, I would say, is just outdoor recreation, which, which makes sense. Uh, outdoor recreation slash consumer. Uh, we really, we don't have much in the way of software or med tech or, or fintech, although we, we do have some, but probably our, our greatest critical mass is in outdoor recreation. But it's also at its, I think it's hard for the state or any central organization to really have their pulse on what's going on in Jackson and Sheridan and Laramie and, and Cheyenne. And so it does make sense to, you know, create a structure and, and some funding that's more localized. And mm -hmm. one of the advantages that I have as, as an angel investor is I know all the entrepreneurs here. So it's not like somebody shows up at your doorstep with a pitch deck and, hey, I'm so-and-so and I have this great business model. Um, if you know the people behind it, that makes a big difference in who you invest with and the, the ultimate success. And, and I might just jump in really quickly to add on to something that Alex is saying. <clears throat> Josh, if I heard you correctly and, and my understanding is correct, one of the things you're kicking around is the fund of funds model, right? And yeah, maybe we can invest directly in some, some startups and things like that, but find some funds to invest in. I mean, I'll, I'll just say it now publicly. I love that idea. I think that's an amazing idea because we've got to do something in Wyoming to maybe incentivize, right? More fund formation and more fund activity, but also again, to, to what we're all just talking about now, where do we double down? Well, Let's, let's let some of those funds with specific, specific areas of expertise and knowledge go hunt those companies down, right? And vet them and figure out where to place those bets. And so to me, that is such an efficient way to get that capital allocated for the highest, you know, return uh, for the state. That just makes a ton of sense to me. Because to Alex's point, we, we do have a lot of diversity and not a lot of concentration, at least from where I sit, in, in terms of, you know, certain industries. We, we kind of have a few pockets. Um, so it's, it's tough to just pick a couple of industries, but I think there are, there are people, there are allocators here, right? We have some very experienced people in that have served in those roles that know how to allocate company, uh, allocate funds to companies, um, and getting money in the right hands of those people that can move quickly and do that, I think is almost as important as, as choosing the right industry. Right. And that's, that is a piece of, of this, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, SSBCI move is to be able to fund funds, not only for, you know, to be able to spread that and to, and to focus it in, but also to gain that expertise that those fund managers have and, um, and be able to, to utilize that. That's, that's really good. Um, I, I think now would be a really good time to turn it over to our board. They'll, they'll likely have a number of questions. So board members, if you could just raise your hand, we will let you ask those questions live. Folks that might be in attendance, if you could just use the Q&A function and, and type those in, then we'll ask those to the best of our ability. Um, and with that, I'll uh, stop talking and we'll let uh, Mark Law, who is uh, probably going to be a Jeopardy champion with that quick buzzer, uh, also <laughs> we'll let him join in. I just, I guess, uh, I was just wondering, is there somebody that could kind of maybe bring the explanation explanation down into the, maybe the more mechanics of what a fun to fun thing would look like. Um, just help me to understand it. I think I understand it, but, but. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I can, I can do that. I think it, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, 
looks like Jason's unable to, to see. I, I do want to make a quick joke about Jason's inability to use technology. Um, <laughs> but then I'll stop. Uh, but Mark, essentially, we have a, a number of options with this SSBCI money and to util utilize it for venture capital. We can fund individual businesses, right? So we can become on the, on the cap table of an individual business by making an investment. But we can also invest and put that money into a fund. So uh, imagine a venture capital fund that then would utilize those funds on businesses in Wyoming that they are also funding. So we're funding a fund, not just an individual business. Does that help? Yeah, that's pretty, much, that's, pretty, that's, that's pretty much what I thought, but, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, I uh, heard it again for clarity's sake. And if I could add, um, I don't think the state is really set up to, you know, thoroughly vet. And I'm not sure whether you really have the, the right talent pool, you know, to vet startups and see which ones are, are worthy of, of investment, you know, better to, to leave it to the professionals. But also, I mean, the idea of the state in investing through a fund of funds is the state should be making a profit. These aren't grants. This isn't money that comes in on one hand and goes out the other hand and we feel good about it. The idea is that you are nurturing success and there'll be a lot of benefits to the state, but one of them should be that eventually the state is getting a, a large capital gain that it can either reinvest in other startups or you know, put into the general fund or, or some other uh, pool of money. So there's some, there's some clear uh, metrics on, on how that money will be invested. Alex, I, I appreciate you making that point because that, that is correct. These funds are intended to not just, uh, not just spur on um, entrepreneurs in, in Wyoming, but they're intended to make a return for the state mm -hmm. that can be then utilized for, for the state. So um, you're absolutely right. Now, um, I am gonna, uh, Chuck, I do see your hand up, but uh, Mr. Kenyon, I am going to uh, give Mr. Kinsler an opportunity to, uh, he raised his real hand mm -hmm his IRL hand, um, and he's going to uh, ask this question now. Oh, technology. Um, I, 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 you know me, I, I don't really have a question for these guys. I know I've asked both of these guys all the questions they want from me. Um, but, but I think um, just, just to capture a couple of things that they said and maybe put a finer tip on it just for our group. Um, I think like, um, a couple things. I think when you hear Matt talking about what is required and what's needed and how being in the circles in Silicon Valley or wherever put you in touch with sort of what's trending, um, I think that's an important observation that we should use wholly across the business council is that we like to be pseudo government and standardize things and make a, a form formula. And that doesn't work in this world because the, the, the deals are so different. The, the way people want to fund is different. One day, Matt and I talk about safes and safe investments, and those are really popular. Then the next month, they're out. And now I'm talking to an investor, and they want to talk about safes. And I'm like, I thought that was out, right? So like, putting that in the government speed is going to be really hard. So I love the idea of the fund of funds as well, because you're, you're kind of kicking that, you're kind of punting that for somebody else to take care of the vetting and, and all of that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, when, when I started, we had to go to Boulder to find the right type of uh, accounting and the right type of uh, attorneys and everything else. And thankfully, Matt came along and, and we got to sort of go that route. But, but um, I think the other thing that I just, I want to probably, this is probably a question, perhaps, Matt, and I say you because you'll, you'll answer this in a very legal way. Um, the, the rub for me in this has always been, even ever since Endow, is that as a government, as a state, as a public entity, we want to fund things. We want to fund uh, organizations or communities or sectors or whatever. But at the end of the day, if you and I had the money in our pocket, we're funding people. And we tr only trust a few of people. And I, I could pick five people that I would probably invest in. So how do you, how do you balance 
that? How do you balance finding the people that are going to move the needle that you want to invest in? And how do you, uh, you know, make it work within this kind of structure? And then the, the last piece uh, I was going to say about that um, is for you, Josh, is I think number one in the VC, SB, SSB, whatever it's called, uh, number one is return on investment. That, that should just be the number one. It should not be supporting entrepreneurs and supporting business. We should just say right out of the gate so that like everybody knows we're going to pick winners. Like we always said, we're going to pick winners. Yes, because we don't pick losers. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Answer that, uh, if you will. Thank you. So before Matt goes, I'm going to say the word yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what I'm, an what I'm answering, uh, but to your, to your point, Jason, about how are we, how are we identifying those people and those, those, again, those places to, to put the capital, I think, I mean, I'm, I, you you all know how to make these decisions. This is this is political, right? This is economic. This is uh, an investment for the state of Wyoming. I think we can be honest about what it is, and I think that's maybe one of the in my, in my opinion one of the shortcomings of um, you know some of the the prior attempts that the state has made in different ways to to boost this is it's either too slow and too much like a program to your point, right? And entrepreneurs don't know how to use it. It's not their speed. Um, I don't know if we know yet how successful or not successful Kickstart was, but I felt like we were at least honest with the Kickstart idea in that th this is this is churn money, right? We're this is a sunk cost. We are just trying to get companies churning so we can even get them to a point of being fundable by by later stage investors. This isn't that either, right? This is this is designed to be money that we're investing, um, higher pressure money, as I would put it, right? This is this is money that should accelerate the growth of those companies and those people or those funds that we believe in and allocate money into places and projects that, you know, we think are going to be visible. They're going to be right. Uh, impactful for, for, for communities and attract the right kinds of people. I, I think it's, I, I don't know that I'm equipped today to tell you, right. Much more specific than that, but I don't know when I, when I envision it in my head, I can sort of see it, you know, I can, I can see the types of projects and the types of things. I think as we've all talked about before, we can't dismiss the fact that infrastructure is a piece of that, right? I mean, buildings, places, amenities, things that people need and want to live and work every day. We can't, I, I, you guys all know way better than I do, so I don't want to preach to, preach to you all, but it seems to me over the last 20 years that it used to be that was all we funded and that was kind of economic development. And then we kind of fell away from that. And then we realized, well, there's, we need some of that. And there's kind of an equilibrium that we're all finding. And I, I, I too believe that, I mean, we, we have to continue to invest in place as well, because that's, that's important. Um, but to, to your point, it's probably more an investment in the people, right. And finding the right people, whether it's companies, whether it's salaries and payroll, uh, I mean, to Alex's point, one of the cool things that I've observed uh, of a lot of the companies that we're working with is scaling a company is hard in Wyoming, super hard, just because of the, the lack of, of talent for a lot of these high growth companies. But with, with kind of one of the blessings of COVID that we've all witnessed is, right, Wyoming's a pretty cool place to live and work um, if you don't have to be in an office. So, I mean, how, how do we accelerate that, right? How do we celebrate that more? How do we, how do we throw, throw uh, some more emphasis on that? Um, that's just one example. I think I'm stating the obvious. We, we all know that. But I, so I think there's a lot of ways that that could be done. I certainly don't have those answers today. But I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think we could look at that just to, to kind of finish that off. I think we can look at that in this program, having a different view of economic development and a different goal and a different um, you know, it's it's different all around. It doesn't have exactly the same rules that that some of the other state funds have, and so that's good because we can fill a gap that we couldn't fill before. But at the same time, we do have other mechanisms that could work hand in hand with that. And I think that's part of of what we're saying is that we need to look at this differently because it is, but we also need to utilize the funds that we do have to help this and make sure that we're we are making it work. And, and making it as successful as possible, given that some of the other funds are, are just different. 
So thank you. That's good. Um, I think Mr. Kenyon has a question and then uh, Mr. Law, I'll go back to you. Yeah, so um, being the new kid on the block with this venture capital stuff, um, the question with the fund to fund venture capital uh, that we were talking about, would that make it easier for the uh, state funds in a sense to come back out of the fund? Um, does the payoff happen faster without um, the return on investment, I should say, without having to um, say if a business had, if a business, because we're buying, when we're doing this, we're in a sense buying equity in a business. Mm -hmm. How do we reclaim the equity at the specific time if the business hasn't been profitable enough to return it? Whereas if we are in a fund to fund situation, can we, is it, do we share that with the other fund? Can we, does that make, does the question make sense, Matt? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I don't know that I'm the right guy to, to answer this. Uh, Alex probably knows a lot more than this. I, if I'm understanding your question right, it's the same problem, right? Just two different scenarios. If you're individually investing in an entity, right? The exit strategy and getting some liquidity back out of that's always going to be a challenge, right? And there's a lot of skill that goes into choosing companies and understanding how to have an exit event of some sort. Uh, the same problem is going to exist in the fund of funds. It's just that you've got professionals theoretically, right? That are running those funds that are worrying about that for you and know how to do that in whatever, you know, particular industry or, or segment that they're making investments in. So they're still gonna have that problem too. I think that's the challenge that a lot of, or if not all uh, venture capital, I mean, the style of venture capital funding generally is more of a term fund, right? A lot of venture capital funds will form for eight to 10 year terms or something like that with the idea being that we're going to make these investments in the front end of our cycle, right? Double and triple down on the ones that are doing well, push them to exit. Um, I mean, it's not uncommon as an example. I've, I've heard venture capitalists tell me that their model is, you know, any given portfolio will maybe invest in 20 or 30 companies. We assume that 70% of those are going to be zeros, right? And 10% of those are going to be you know, 100% return on our equity. And we're, we're looking for the two in that group that are going to be home runs, right, to make the return on the fund. That that really is the venture capital model. So it's very, very different than, as, as you know, many people have said, the private equity model or the even, even the lending model. So it's a very different style, but I think that's what's appropriate here too. Yeah, Alex, I think it would be good to, to hear from you yeah. on that one too. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so your typical venture fund usually has around a 10-year lifespan. So this, this is a, you know, a longer term investment. It's, you know, you don't have the liquidity that you have in the stock market or the bond market. And usually like the first six years, you're just investing your funds and maybe doing some follow-on investing in your winners. And then the next four years, you're trying to, you know, harvest those gains. And so that's one of the advantages of a fund of funds is if you're in diversified among a, you know, a couple of professionally managed funds, you know, that's to reducing the state's risk. Um, but at the end of the day, the venture capital partners, they don't get paid until they have successful exits on the companies that they've invested in. So they don't wanna get stuck in some poorly performing, you know, as what we call a zombie company any more than you do. Because the sooner you can, you know, get those um, successes and have a liquidity event, whether it's somebody buys them or they do an IPO, uh, that's how everybody benefits. So, so clearly the, the fund managers and the, the state's incentives are aligned here. All right, thank you. I think in order, we had uh, Mr. Law, Ms. Johnson, and Ms. Tomasi. So we'll go with you. Uh, Mark. Thanks, Josh. Um, in the, the risk of maybe overdriving my headlights a little bit with some of these questions, if we're perhaps <clears throat> a little uncomfortable with trying to pick specific startups and, and a fund to fund is more appealing, how equipped are we to select the funds that invest in 
to invest in, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm only chuckling because I'm not sure we have that many to choose from in Wyoming. So uh, you know, <laughs> we might have to take what we can get. <laughs> Okay. Well, and I, fair, and I, I believe one of the one of the requirements is going to be, you know, ultimately they're investing a, a, their portion into Wyoming companies. So it, it is possible even to, to invest in other funds, but those have to be those. That's, that's that what are. that's what I mean, like a desig, designated. I mean, there may be some specific funds for specific Wyoming, but I was wondering if there's some other maybe higher profile that, that would accept a portfolio specific to Wyoming. Yeah, so that'll go in, into that. That'll be into those next steps of, of how. Yeah, the the, ta the tactical stuff. So okay, okay. I'm I'm done asking questions. A good we question. Start, we start waving be. money around. We'll probably have a few chasing us. So, so yeah. Funny how can that I, works. Can I can I yeah. just add one thing? Yeah. You know, I, I would anticipate or, or recommend that, you know, if the state is investing in a fund, you know, whether it's a new fund or an existing fund that it match what private investors are putting in. So I think that reduces the risk because basically you're relying on these other investors to do the due diligence. And if, they're, if they have skin in the game, then it's probably worth uh, the state also have skin in, skin in the game. Yep, yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good thing to think about and a great point that we won't miss. So thanks, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Oh, you're muted. My question was along those lines, just how many funds are there in Wyoming? And I think Matt chuckly, you know, he's chuckling over there, but uh, we don't have a lot, but we do have, and maybe we could think about working with uh, people like Gary Miller, who is on, he's on a national board that, um, does some funds and not that that's an answer, but we may have to look at some other alternatives. Um, and how many, do you happen to know how many, um, Alex or Matt, do you happen to know how many Wyoming funds there are? Two, um, are there two? Cindy, Cindy, I think, um, I actually think Bert, who might be on now, um, can oh. he probably has a pretty good feel for that. Hey, hey, Bert. Oh, okay. Josh, yeah, I can take that, Cindy. So right now, the ones that I know of, we have one as Breakthrough 307. It is a general, it's an angel fund. Um, and then the other one is Echelon. And they have a fund and they're based in Evanston, but they also have operating companies. So it's kind of a, a split deal where they have a fund, but they also have operating companies that they fund with that. Those are the two that I'm aware of that are traditional funds. Now, Alex has talked about, right, there's an angel group up in Jackson. There are angels all over the state, but from a traditional fund perspective, it's this two. And I would, I would, I would add to that. I, I can't speak for the Jackson crowd so much because I know that there's a lot of venture capital connected folks or founders of funds or something that, that might spend time in Jackson. But there's a fund out of uh, Billings that's relatively new, um, and they they've been doing uh, deals in Wyoming. There is a fund uh, down in Colorado um, that one of their founders is uh, from Laramie, Wyoming originally, and so they they have done some deals up here. So. That, that would be one of my recommendations as well is there's there's that right mix, in, right? I mean, there's there's venture capitalists that really know what they're doing and are well connected. Right. And I think obviously that has to be taken into account because if you can allocate money to some of those people, that's that's great. But I think that has to be balanced with, of course, people that also love to hear about Wyoming too, right? And have an interest in making sure that those funds get allocated. I mean, you can put program requirements on it or whatever, but but making sure that they care about Wyoming, um, I think is a piece of that too, because I don't know. And Matt, thank you for bringing up the accounting piece because that was probably a very, um, as you stick your toe into many countries and sell in many states, some accountants don't want to get into that, you know, filing in all those states and filing it across the you know, borders. And so you really have to dig and find and shovel and, 
and beg <laughs> some accountants just to to get that done for you. So well, thank and you just to just out. to just to hammer that point home on on the funded uh, fund sides. I mean, most funds, I don't know, Alex, you might have a better sense than I do on, on venture capital funds, but most funds use some kind of a fund administrator service uh, to just administer investor relations, accounting, investor statements, just kind of all the back end stuff. There are zero fund administrators in Wyoming, zero that I'm aware of, at least. Um, you know, there's some in Denver, there's some in Salt Lake, but that's another piece of this, right? Just, just to kind of cultivate a venture capital industry we have to recognize that I'm, I'm not even convinced we have the pieces necessarily for some of these funds to, to operate solely within Wyoming. Matt, that's a great point. We have a lot of trust administrative companies. Right, Sir right. Jackson. So maybe, maybe there's a, you know some synergy there to add the, the fund to funds accounting piece. Yeah, good, good point. Wait, uh, thanks, Cindy, for bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. Hi, this, this question is for Alex and it kind of is a, a twist around some of the things we've been talking about. Hi, Alex. Um, Hi. You, you mentioned, and at the very beginning, you said you, your organization uh, did some mentoring, but you were using the wrong model. So you went to MIT got, uh, and came back and used some of the things that they had said worked. What were your biggest takeaways from that? And how does that apply to the state of Wyoming? And what's the hopes for venture capitalism in the state of Wyoming? What would you say are some of the biggest things that you are now utilizing through the MIT program? MIT provided us with a really good playbook and sort of a framework of how you structure the relationship between the mentors and the mentees and certain do's and don'ts and you know how frequently you have the meetings and we've probably kept with with 80 percent of of how they run things so it was just you know rather than trying to recreate the wheel we kind of had a a pre-packaged deal that we could uh open up and then and then work from and that that's been a big success so, so one of the big strategic questions that Silicon Coolar, you know, revisits regularly is, you know, what is our, what's our geography? And we realized pretty early on that we're really a regional organization. We're not, we, we don't have the capabilities and I don't think our model would work if we tried to go statewide. And so we define our area as you know, Teton County, sort of Northern Sublet and Lincoln County, and then also uh, Teton Valley, Idaho, because so many people commute from there and because the cost of um, living and also of commercial space is cheaper over there. We've had some startups who, you know, moved over the pass. Um, so I don't think we can, I think we're very strong in our in our region, but certainly we're very eager to share our knowledge and help other uh, you know, organizations try to do something similar elsewhere in the state. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Moore, you have the floor. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about, you know, any of those aspects Matt and Alex, that we should be considering in terms of that ecosystem that's core to it. I know we've talked a lot about, you know, mentorship. I think too, some of the things that we picked up, you know, as, as Heather and some others have talked through like, you know, the various different levels of mentorship based on, you know, where the company, you know, happens to be and being able to graduate from mentor to mentor per se, you know, as, as you, you know, grow into different areas. So I want to talk about that, but I also want to make sure that we talk about, I mean, both of you have walked Wyoming companies through these things and have hit some trials and tribulations um, in, you know, getting uh, funds to look at, at some companies. And I know there's a balance, like we don't want to just give people money because they're like, we're, they're a Wyoming company. 
But at the same time too, we wanna make sure that we're investing and that maybe some of the lessons learned if we're really honest about some past money that's been pushed in some of these directions is there's been a lot of really big hurdles put in front of some companies um, that were probably not necessary. And so trying to, you know, any recommendations that you have for that balance where we are, you know, trying to emphasize like this needs to go to some Wyoming companies here. And it's not just you get a pass because you're a Wyoming company, but it's also, you know, trying to make sure that we get, get the investment and start getting our ROI too. Alex, go for it. I'll go okay. Um I think one thing that will really help is by developing a network of funds around the state. So, you know, if a company's trying to raise a million dollars, your your lead investor might invest a quarter or, or 50% of that. But it's one thing if a company from Jackson knocks on the door of Breakthrough 307 and says, hey, here's our pitch book. It's completely different if they go to an, another fund in Wyoming or in one of the bordering states and said, we're from Jackson, Silicon Cool Wars Angel Fund is investing in us. You know, They did all the due diligence. There's a due diligence report that we can share with you. Are you interested in, in joining the syndicate? And that really helps create the ecosystem and just makes it less labor and time intensive for a startup to raise money. So I'm not sure if that answers your, your direct question, but that's, I think one of the things we can, we can hope, hope to get out of this. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a ton to add to that. I think Alex is right on the money with that. I mean, I, I think we see all the time, I mean, this isn't news to any of you, but it, it, it's a lot of work if companies are not just going the angel route and kind of raising grassroots money, if they really are going for larger amounts of capital, it is hard to get that first right lead investor. It's really hard. And once you get that first lead investor, it accelerates the process tremendously. So that that is a place where this a program like this could really step into that gap and say, hey, right through this fund, we, we've got our first million bucks or whatever. And now you go to some other VCs and it all of a sudden has a, a different level of attraction. So I think I think Alex is, is right on the money with that. I mean, the other, the other piece that I see, and this is, uh, again, I, I feel like I'm constantly coming at this from two different angles. One is sort of the grassroots, like we're trying to solve everybody's problem. And one is kind of the, the big policy level. But one, one of the grassroots problems that I, I have seen a change in the tide, it's very slow, but I've seen a change in the tide is just the, I don't even know that it's a stigma, but just the, the fact that we are Wyoming. Um, and so, so, so few people, I think in the larger, you know, the, the U S uh, the, the larger, um, startup communities and circles, I mean, as we, as I talked about at the very beginning, there's kind of the standard deal terms that everybody sees. Right. And one of those is right. You're going to domicile in Delaware, right. Your team's going to be based in, you know, Seattle or Silicon Valley or New York or whatever. And I, I think we are just now really for the first time in my career where I'm seeing meaningful opportunities where that doesn't matter as much anymore. And maybe that's thanks to COVID. Maybe that's in part thanks to some of the, uh, the, the job that Wyoming has done making itself attractive. But again, I think, I think there's a little bit of momentum there. And so you combine that momentum with, with some opportunity for visibility and a lead investor that, that people can, can take to the market and take to other investors, it starts to legitimize Wyoming as a destination too. Yeah. And I'd like to add a couple of people have made a comment to me that, you know, it's a chicken and egg, you know, there no, there are not a lot of startups in Wyoming, so there's no money. And because there's no money in Wyoming, there are no startups. And if we had some additional funding and some new funds, that's going to attract companies to come to Wyoming. You know, if, if the money's there, there will be people who are like, well, should I locate here or here? Should my head be headquarters in Silicon Valley or, you know, somewhere in Wyoming? And that can make the big difference if, if they're confident that they can get funding to build the company to the level where they can try to get, you know, funding from nationally 
based VCs. Yeah, and I, I think where, where we're going with that, Alex, I, I think we hear that a lot, right? And, and our goal is to sort of get rid of the, the discussion about what's the chicken and what's the egg and how does that work? And instead say, okay, how do we catalyze this? And where are we gonna make a bet to push it forward? And that's why I think this is really pretty exciting. And I think that through this discussion with, with both of you, it's been pretty eye-opening to, to see some really, some of the nuance that needs to happen with these, whether we're funding funds or whether we're funding individuals and how that is done regionally, how that's done with the mentorship model, a lot of these things make a lot of a lot more sense now. Um, there is a question on the, um, and this is probably a question for Bert um, on the, the Q&A. And this one comes from uh, Fred Schmeckel of Impact 307. He asked a really good question. I think we, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, um, but Bert does have a really good feel for how this money fits into the overall spectrum of uh, from idea to say IPO. Right, um, and so his question is, what can the SSBCI program do to specifically help companies that need a bridge for first article funding? Thinking here of a bridge, of bridging the gap that frequently occurs between SBIR cycles as companies go from prototype to commercializable product. So thanks, Josh, um, and thanks, Fred, for that question. I, I think there's a couple options, right? So one is specifically in SBIR, those companies have the ability to do these new things. So phase 2B, phase 2E, TACFI, STRAPFI that help them. They have to raise outside funds first, and then the federal granting agency will match that one-to-one -one in order to help them commercialize. So that's one. And in that, if they're raising a traditional round with that, maybe it's pre-seed, maybe it's seed to get that early capital, somewhere between 375 and maybe 500,000 that they'll match. Um, the funds that we fund would likely be the place that would participate in those rounds. Now, if it's further along and they're raising maybe like a late seed series A or early B, then maybe the direct co-investment from SSBCI could play a role. But that, that's how I would answer that question is more than likely it would be the fund as they raise a traditional round in the pre-seed seed area that could help support that gap. And Josh, can I jump in on that? Yes, please. Yeah. As, as an angel investor and, and more of a generalist, you know, it can be a real challenge when somebody comes to you with this, you know, great idea and this incredible technology and science. And if it's all conceptual, it's really hard to evaluate and it's really risky. But then if they can come to me and say, well, you know, we have SBIR funding, well, that's sort of, that's a level of due diligence that's already been done. But even better, if they can come to me and say, we did several rounds of SBIR funding, and now we have a commercially viable product, and we need money to you know, start selling it to our customers, then that's like, you know, hallelujah, that has de-risked the business model so much, and it's much more attractive. Excellent. Matt, anything to add on that one, I think? No, I think I think they've covered it. Good, good. Uh, Jason has figured out how to use his hand now. I don't know if he's just joking around or if he's really um, utilizing it for its uh, actual use. Jason, I'm going to call on you now, even though your hand is now down. It's uh, if you ever want to know on Chrome on a Chromebook, it's in a different spot. You have to click on participants and find it. Um, just one statement uh, from what Chuck was saying earlier. If we all remember that, go back in time. But, but just as a whole, I think like our mission, our goal in this should be to do better and outperform the permanent fund investments. Like I think we should make more money on this program than, than the state makes using traditional methods. Like that's the idea behind these high risk investments. It's not to take a bunch of risks, it's to raise more money, hopefully. And so part of the goal there should be let's, let's outperform the things that we've typically had in the past. And so I just want to give that perspective to the people that were like, how does this work? And how do we get our money back and all that? It's like, let's make the investment and get a bigger return. This isn't like a WBC investment where the return is jobs and like the slow, slow burn. Let's, let's make the money. Right. And anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for putting up with my hand raising. No, I think that's a really good point, Jason. And I'm sure 
that being able to frame our success in something that people are sort of familiar with or comfortable with is, is a really big key here. Um, we also know that there will be the ancillary benefits, right? We, we do know that. So that's, that's the other good part of it. So um, yeah, excellent. Um, any other questions? We are, we're, we're wrapping things up. Any other questions before I, I I'm going to, I'm going to put Alex and Matt back on the spot and have them kind of just uh, provide a couple closing comments if they don't mind. So looks like no more hands. So we're going to turn it over. Um, Alex, uh, any, anything to, to close with or anything that you want to leave our, our board and, and the folks on the line with? I'll just say thank you for the opportunity to address you. I think this is an incredible opportunity for, for the state of Wyoming. And I realize it's you know, sort of unfamiliar territory uh, to some of the folks on, on the council. So appreciate you taking the time to, to learn and get up to speed. But again, I think this is a great opportunity for the state. Cool. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and, and same. Thank you, Josh, and to the board for the invitation and, and hosting. And thank you all for thinking about this, right, and pushing this forward. Um, you know, I couldn't make it through this without mentioning the crypto space. But one of the one of the observations I have to make about the crypto space over the last few years is whether you love it or hate it, no matter what you think about it, people in New York City are talking about Wyoming, right? People in Los Angeles are talking about Wyoming. And I think a program like this gives you all an opportunity to shout from the rooftops, look what we're doing for the state of Wyoming, which gets people talking about Wyoming. And I, I think, again, um, I've yelled at Governor Mead about this many, many times, and I've told Governor Gordon too, we don't do a good enough job shouting from the rooftops, you know, what we've done for ourselves and what we've done for the businesses and our, and our, on our ecosystem here. And crypto is one of those few little rabbit holes that has kind of caught the attention of a lot of people, but it's worked, right? It, it really, people call and want to move their businesses here. And they don't even know why they just know that people are talking about Wyoming. Um, it's not, I don't think that unachievable to do that in this context, right. And to, to create an opportunity and and support that with the optics of the opportunity for something like this so i i hope you all shout it from the rooftops and pat yourselves on the back a little bit because i think just getting this conversation elevated and getting it out there is going to be the start right of of something better to come very good thank you and and you know heck i don't i don't think there's anything i could add to to what both of you have just said and and i I appreciate your time here for sure. And I appreciate the board joining in and taking such an interest in this because it is new, it's exciting. It is something that we will definitely uh, make sure we talk about a lot and make, make sure we shout about it. It is uh, not gonna be without its uh, little twists and turns and pitfalls and fun. Um, but I think you're, you're exactly right, Matt. This is, a, this is a big deal. And I think we need to recognize it as that and, and make sure that we push it out there and, and let people know that this, is, this isn't the same old stuff. This is new stuff and uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So appreciate your time. Appreciate the work that you all do with entrepreneurs though. Um, I, I, I know that you don't uh, probably think it goes unnoticed and, and, and you probably think, Oh, I'm doing it for, I'm doing it for the entrepreneurs. I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it for my business, but it is really, really important to the state what you do. And, and we appreciate you taking your time today, which is very valuable and, and appreciate you sharing your expertise. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, stop recording and, and close this one down. Thanks again, everybody, for joining in.